So again, so my name is Josh Beekler. I'm the director of rehab. I'm a PT um, by trade, and we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about safe patient handling. We're going to talk about transfers. We're going to talk about just levels of mobility. Um, how to how to set up and use different assistive devices. Um, we're going to talk about the blue neuro chair, um, and then any other questions um, you might have. And oh, hello there! Welcome to everybody on the internet. There, so you should are watching your orientation video. You're part of a live class. So. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's talk about levels of mobility first. Uh, so first and foremost is dependent. Uh, so this patient is unable to help at all. Uh, the caregiver, you're doing 100% of the work. So you are almost, or you are basically always going to use a full lift uh, for a patient who is dependent. Next is maximal assist. So the patient can help up to 50% um, of their of their body weight. Uh, the caregiver is doing 50 to 99 percent. So if somebody weighs 300 pounds, that's 150 pounds at least that you are assisting them with. Or if they weigh 400 pounds, it's 200 pounds at least that you are helping them with. So this is a uh, a very significant amount of um, help that you're having to provide somebody. Uh, moderate assist. So the patient can do 50 to 75 percent of the work. Uh, the caregiver does 25 to 50 percent. Uh, minimal assistance. Um, patient does 75 to 99. You're doing one to 25% of the work. Uh, generally, these patients are moving pretty easy. Um, you're just a little bit more than hands-on for men assist. So next is contact guard assist, and this is kind of the sneaky one. This is These patients can trick you. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to have your hands on these patients at all times, um, but really it's for steadying assist or balance. So the patient is physically capable of getting up and walking. They just might be a disaster when they do so. They may. Um, have just terrible balance, they might, their knees might give out every third or fourth step, so you need to have your hands on at all times. But a lot of times, uh, these are patients that we see sometimes that just get progressed a little bit too quickly uh, by staff because they look like they, they should be able to get up and walk um, by themselves. So, so be real leery of contact guard assist. Uh, standby assist, so again, don't need to have your hands on the patient, but you need to be within arm's reach. Again, um, they're doing pretty darn well, but they're just not in that full uh, circle of trust yet that we have. So um, total joints are a really good example of these kinds of patients where um, they're moving really well, um, but you just need to stay within arm's reach um, and stay close to them. And then finally, we have independent and modified independence. So these, tables, these patients can uh, walk and, and do everything by themselves. Uh, modified independent just means they can do it with some type of assistive device, whether it's a walker or a cane or a crutch. So, any questions on any of that so far? So what you should notice um, in your patient's rooms on the whiteboard is that if therapy is involved, they should write the level of assistance um, that the patient uh, that the patient requires. So if they're if they're a, a max assist of two, uh, more, most likely for you they're going to write full lift. Um, but if they're you know if they're contact guard assist, um, the expectation is that you have your hands on them every time they get up and move. Uh, other things you might notice is you might notice two lines. You might say, you might see nursing to do this, therapy is working on this. So that's not an effort to say we don't think you're capable or anything like that. Um, it's more we're working on something and you might see us from the hallway working on a pivot transfer, but what you don't know is that it was a total disaster. We almost went down we just don't want to put anybody in a bad situation, whether patients or you guys. Um, to work on that. So you might you might see us working on a transfer and then we write full lift for nursing and you think, well, we need to get this patient up and going, get them moving, um, but we're very deliberate about if we write full lift on that, that that's, it's a good idea for you to use a full lift and we will keep trying to progress them and keep trying to get them uh, going to the point that um, we feel like it's safe that everybody can kind of do the same, that same level of transfer. So, uh, so you should see that um, on the whiteboards, especially when therapy is involved. Uh, if you have patients where you don't know how they move or you're, you're kind of afraid of how they move and therapy is not involved, it's a good idea, idea to get uh, PT and OT involved. So any questions about the levels of assistance? All right. Um, let's talk about assistive devices then. The one you're most commonly going to see is a front wheel walker. Um, it's got wheels on the front and then gliders on the back. Sometimes you'll see tennis balls in the back, but for the most part, you shouldn't see tennis balls anymore just because they're an uh, uh, infection risk. Um, so wheels on the front, gliders on the back. Uh, what's nice about these is you can just 
push them in front of you and they'll just and they'll they'll go around uh, along without you having to pick them up but they also won't get away from you either like a, you'll see a lot of people who have four-wheeled walkers uh, those are fine for patients who know how to use them but if they don't know how to use the handbrakes they're going to get out away from them because they can they can really uh, you put a little pressure on them they can they can um, get going in a hurry so the front wheel walkers are nice because if you use them properly which is standing up real nice and tall if you kind of imagine the walker being doubled behind them if they stay inside that that kind of that circle so this much and this much they don't have to be their legs don't have to be touching the front of the walker but if their legs are kind of at the back the back legs of the walker that's about where you want them um, where you get into trouble are the patients that are out here. That's problematic, but we've all seen that person. I'll, I'll work with that person. We just really try to encourage them to get up inside their walker, use it appropriately. Because if they do so, if they're up inside their walker, I mean, you can put really any amount of pressure on this walker that you like. You can, you can essentially um, hang all of your weight on it. Um, and you can do really any level of uh, weight bearing status with the walker as well. So non weight bearing status is obviously can't put any weight on the leg. It's best to have that leg kind of hanging out in front um, of them. Set the walker ahead, you know, six to 12 inches, something like that. And then have them use their arms just to kind of swing forward and they can maintain a non weight bearing status with this. Even though it looks like it has wheels on it, maybe you shouldn't. It's safe to do with this uh, device. Toe touch weight bearing is just touching toes down for balance. So um, we tell patients a lot of times that imagine there's an egg under your foot. If you crack that egg, you put too much pressure on the ground. So it's literally just touching your toes down for balance. It's non weight bearing plus just the weight of your toes on the ground. So it's just kind of uh, for just a little bit of steadiness balance um, on, on their feet. Um, but you use it the same way. Walker goes ahead. You set that toe touch weight bearing uh, leg ahead first and bring your other foot ahead next to it. Uh, partial weight bearing status. Sometimes you'll see that. The most common partial weight bearing status is 50% is, is how it'll be written. Sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 75, but usually 50% um, is the most common definition of partial weight bearing. So when I'm standing here without holding on to anything, I got 50% of my weight on each leg, so I'm partial weight, I'm 50% weight bearing. The trouble gets to be when I go to take a step on the opposite leg. So if this is my partial weight bearing status, 50%, when I go to step, now I got 100% of my weight on this leg. So that's when the walker comes into, into play. So I set the walker ahead, set my uh, effective leg ahead, put some pressure on the walker, offset about half my weight, and then set the other foot ahead. So um, that is the partial weight bearing status. And then obviously weight bearing is tolerated as just as much weight as they can tolerate. So any questions on the weight bearing statuses? All right, so the walkers are what you're going to see. 97% uh, of the time here. Um, it's the safest device and it ha mostly because it has four points of contact that provide a really nice wide base of support. Like you said, I, like I said before, I can, I can hang on this thing, it doesn't really move. It's, it's a very stable device. The next device you might see once in a while is a cane. And the canes can have four points or just one point. So canes are, are handy for maybe that contact guard assist patient who just needs something a little bit to steady them. Um, again, this isn't a weight bearing device by any means. Um, if, you, if I start putting a little bit of pressure on it, it's just, it's, it's too small of a base of support and the, the single point cane's even worse. You really can't put a lot of weight through your arm on this without it eventually uh, uh, toppling over and then you on top of it. So, um, so a cane's kind of usually the, uh, offers the least amount of support. What you'll see a lot of times here as well, this is called a hemi walker. So we use this a lot for patients who've had a stroke. Uh, maybe they've had some type of heart procedure uh, where they can't use their arm for a while, but one of their arms, a lot of, if they're using this, a lot of times it's because one of their arms is incapacitated, um, but they still need something that's really <coughs> sturdy. So kind of like the cane, except the four points of stability are much larger. So you have a much wider uh, base of support. Uh, you can bear a lot more weight on this. So um, which side do you use the cane on, or the cane or the heavy walker on? You use it on the opposite side of the affected leg. So why is that? Um, so if my left leg is my affected or my weak leg, uh, so when I go to, and, and I put it on my left side, so what am I going to naturally do onto the cane or the hemi walker? I'm going to shift my weight a little bit over here to my left side. 
So when I, as I shift my weight over here on my left side, I'm shifting my weight onto my affected weak, hurt leg. But if I put it on the opposite side, and I go to set my, my affected leg ahead, so I'm shifting my weight over here to the cane, off of my affected leg, I'm able to take a lot more weight off of uh, off that weak or off that injured leg uh, with the, uh, um, the, the cane or the hemi walker on the opposite side. So you can't maintain like a non-weight bearing with this. Probably the best you could do probably is about 50%. Um, but uh, uh, that's why anyway, that's why you put it on the opposite side of your uh, affected leg. So a lot of times we use these with stroke patients. Any questions on that so far? All right, very good. Uh, gate belts. So let's talk about gate belts. So kind of the standard gate belt we should see out on the floors is the rainbow colored one. So there's, there's, there's the pink ones, which are the shortest. Rainbow is the mid middle length and blue is the longest. So um, we've kind of gone with the rainbow being the standard just because uh, uh, the pink ones just do not fit everybody. They're just not long enough. And more often than not, you run and get a gate belt, you get there and, all, and you go to put it around them and it's not gonna, it's not, it's not gonna happen. Um, so the rainbow ones are kind of the standard. They should fit 96% of our patients, I would say. Um, but, and then you'll need those blue ones um, on, on, the, on the much larger patients. So as far as where the gate belt goes, um, so applying the gate belt, stop that first. Put it through the teeth first, and then you can put it through the other loop, and then it's snug. So um, I don't know. Most uh, like football belts are like this. Um, I don't know, ladies, what kind of belt you guys have that would be applicable? But football belts work just like this. So um, where the belt should go is around your waist is best. This is where you can get the most leverage on your patient. But we've all been in that situation where we walk into a room, we got too short of a belt, and it's not gonna go around their waist, so what's the second best location? Is just under their arms. Um, the other reason, and this might be uh, an okay thing, is for patients who have any type of uh, spinal or, um, or uh, abdominal incision. Uh, chest tubes are kind of tricky. Um, I'd suggest putting the chest tube below, or putting the gate belt below the chest tube. Um, if you can, just be really careful about that it doesn't ride up a whole bunch when you go to go to a system. Um, but if, if that's not going to work, you can always go above as well. Just be really careful of those, those uh, chest tube sites. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, when you go to assist somebody with a gate belt, um, when they them standing versus uh, or sitting versus standing with the gate belt on, or body chemistry proportions kind of change sitting to standing, so you will have to adjust it. Um, on just about everybody when you go from a sitting to standing position. So tighten the gate belt when they stand up. Um, do not lift or pull uh, if, if, you, if you can avoid it. Um, let the patient initiate it and just kind of use the gate belt to, to guide them, especially if you have it around uh, their waist, you can really help with their hips. Um, as opposed to under their arms, I mean, it's, it's a secondary location to have it, but um, a lot of times your patients are just, it's just more uncomfortable and you don't get, have as good a leverage and it's just, you just don't have as good of a fulcrum or a lever uh, to assist that patient, especially if they really need some assistance uh, to get up. But, um, but when using the gate belt, let the patient initiate it, let them be the ones to, to uh, uh, stand before you start pulling on them. Uh, because what's, ever, what's a patient's first inclination to do to, if you start pulling on them before they're ready is to resist you. So if you're wanting to stand them up and you go to, you bring their hips forward, what are they, they're going to slam their shoulders back. Um, if they're sitting on the edge of the bed, now you've got a patient whose hips are forward, shoulders are back, and they are sliding off the edge of the bed. So, uh, so give them time. Make sure that you uh, let them initiate the transfer as much as they can. A lot of times they'll surprise you how well they can do. Um, other transfer kind of tips and tricks. Um, again, don't uh, do not uh, lift with your back or lift with your shoulders. The more you can use your the strongest muscles, which are in your glutes and your legs, the more you can uh, do a little bit of a squat and assist patients to, to stand. The better. The more the, uh, the least amount of twisting you can do. So picking your feet up and turning as you go, um, keeping your your feet shoulders. Uh, or feet, uh, knees, hips, and shoulders aligned, uh, kind of in a straight position, will help you and, and uh, save you some long-term headaches and long-term back aches. 
Um, and then as, as often as you can, like I said, let the patient initiate the transfer, let them help. So, um, so we're, I'm gonna kind of demonstrate a transfer. So I need a, I need a, anything. All right, Michelle. <laughs> don't hurt All right, Michelle, have a seat. <laughs> don't hurt your thumb. Don't hurt your thumb. Yeah, thumb injury. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right, so Michelle's sitting on the edge of the bed. <laughs> Perfect. And here is the recliner. We got the the room set up perfectly how we want it. Um, you know, we have we got we got the telemetry monitor up here. Um, you know, it, this is exactly what we want. Uh, except that her, uh, Michelle had a stroke and she's very weak on her right side. So, um, she sure put this gate belt around here. Don't help at all. Yeah. <laughs> you can help a little bit. I mean, you're not going to totally solve the problem. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's good. All right. So, all right. So, we, uh, we want to go to our right. However, that's her weak side. It's not going to go, and, and I need to assist her on her right side because I need to block her right leg when she stands. I want to support her right arm. Well, I can't very well do that standing over here if this is my destination. Um, we have a lot more work to do. If all we're doing is a pivot transfer, we have a ton of work to do to get from here to there if this is her weak side. So take the extra 10 seconds, unlock the chair, like swing, swing the chair. it around to the foot of the bed. I know it's a pain. I don't like doing it either. Uh, but it's going to save you a ton of time, a ton of work, a ton of just, um, uh, it's just going to save you a lot, of, a, a lot of energy if you just swing that chair around to the foot of the bed. Um, so just really think about, especially with your heavier assist patients, having a plan and maybe having a backup plan, um, a patient where you're just like, oh man, I'm not sure we're going to make it to the bathroom, maybe position the recliner halfway to the bathroom where you, so you have like a, a, a halfway point where you can, you have some ability to stop halfway. Um, I mean, you should have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen, but uh, but if you're not exactly sure, have have a couple backup plans in place so you're not uh, left in a lurch. All right, so we swung the chair around, and we have a hemi locker in the room already. So I'm going to put this just in front of you here, and and what's her first reaction going to be to do? It's going to be to reach for that that hemi locker that's too far away from her. So you're going to reach, and there she, and this side's oh, weak yeah. and plastic, so you can't reach it out. <laughs> and so we're not like in a very good position here. So we're, all right, Michelle, we're going to sit back, and then on three, you and I are going to stand up together. I'm going to block your right side. I'm going to support okay. your right arm, and all we're going to do is stand up. Okay, are you ready? Here we go, one, two, and oh, I did it too soon, I did it too quick. That was a lot of work for me. Um, I went on two, I went too quick. She helped me a little bit, but normally, I had never gotten anybody to do this yet. But normally your reaction when I lift you too soon is to be like, whoa, what are you doing? You know, Michelle's freak like, out a little bit. Playing. And uh, she's gonna wanna throw her shoulders back, hips go forward, and then off the edge of the bed we go. So, so again, let her do the work. All right, Michelle, I'm going to block your knee over here and support you, and I want you to push up from the imaginary okay. bed right over here. Okay. On three, one, two, three, stand on up. We're just going to stand here for a second. Perfect. You did great. Fantastic. All right, now I want you to put your hand on that heavy walker. I got your, your right leg blocked over here, and I want you to set that left foot ahead just six inches. Perfect. Nice job. We're going to do just like a little shimmy over here, and we're moving along the way. All right, we're in front of the chair. I want you to reach for the arm of that chair. And set your bottom straight back in that chair. Way to go. And you made it. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so that, and, and I know that transfers are not always perfect situations and perfect scenarios. And, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, but it, if, you, if you think about just having a backup plan once in a while, transfer to the strong side, put yourself in a position to succeed, get the help that you need. Um, the more you get in a hurry, the more it seems like you run into problems and run into issues that, that cost you a ton of time later. Uh, are there any like weird situations that you're dying to ask about that you've come across <coughs> where it's like, this? how do you do this? This is always a disaster for me. All right, very good. All right, um, very good. What else do I got here? Thank you, Michelle. That is all I needed to do. Okay, so the blue chair. We're going to talk about the blue neuro chair here. All right, so some of you have worked here a while. Remember the pink Cadillac chairs? 
These are just like a wider version of that. Really handy for patients who are maybe a little bit impulsive, uh, patients who maybe just have really bad trunk control. Uh, you just don't know if they're gonna be able to sit in a kind of normal recliner um, hardly at all. So this is kind of a good starter chair for those kind of patients. So, so real impulsive patients, uh, real, uh, you know, real weak trunk control issue uh, type patients where you're just not sure that, they're, that their trunk's gonna be able to remain upright um, sitting in a chair for any amount of time. So what's nice about these chairs is that you can get them fairly, you can get them pretty comfortable. I mean, because the back and the legs can be adjusted separately. Oops. Or you can kind of do everything together. Um, and then it also has a nice feature where you can tilt it in space. You can tip it back a little bit. So again, that impulsive patient who's you know constantly trying to launch themselves out of the chair, this kind of gives you one more little, it makes it a little bit tougher. It doesn't tilt a ton, but it does tilt them back a little bit. And it's, it's, it'd be some work to get out of this chair. Um, the other nice thing about it is we have a seatbelt seat on it that we're calling a positional device. And it truly is it's a positional device. It's not a restraint. Um, I wouldn't even call it a seat belt. It's, it's truly a positional device. It's uh, just a Velcro strap that they can easily remove themselves. Uh, but this just kind of maybe gives you one more um, little trick, little just extra, um, what do I want to say? Just, a, just another safety feature to keep your a little bit more impulsive patients um, in this recliner. So I would say if, we, if we're using this on a patient, you're probably not going to have them in it for more than an hour or two, most likely. Um, it's something that you're just trying, we're just trying to get them up in some kind of chair for a little while. Um, and then we can kind of graduate on to uh, kind of the normal recliners. Um, if you have a patient you think would be a good candidate for this, uh, we keep these chairs in the therapy department. So just talk to whichever PT or OT is working with the patient. If you're on night shift, talk to the day shift so they can talk to therapy and then we'll arrange to get it uh, to you. We'll come and change the batteries um, and take care of all that. So um, any questions on the blue neuro chair? How many do you have? We have two. So, all right, just anything else that we need to cover? Pink all right. sheets. Oh, the pink slips. All right, Jess is going to take over for the pink slips. Thanks, Josh. Okay, show of hands, how many use these? Okay, so this is a lot more that use these. These are super helpful for you guys. They're here to help your backs. Uh, this last few months, we've had quite a few back injuries, complete back injuries from boosting. So that's why we've implemented these pink slips. Um, whichever direction you're going to move your patient, that's the way the arrows are going to go. Okay, so if you're boosting your patient, this slides right underneath them. Um, and then if that patient's able to, they can boost themselves up. Um, we're going to do a little demo here. <laughs> All right. Can you take the one? Two to make her go on her head. Mm -hmm. He's trying to level her. <laughs> there you go. Jump up there. This thing will tilt on me, will it? Oh, yeah. Set the brakes, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the follow coordinator? Where's right. the brakes set? No, it's not. There we go. All right. Okay, I'm going this way instead. So if your patient's able to do it themselves, they can lift their knees up and just push yourself up. Just be careful because you're great on the edge. Yeah, it's that easy, it. guys. It's that simple to have your patient boosted. All right, slide back down. If your patient is unable to, you can take a draw sheet. You'll put the draw sheet right underneath their legs right here, and then two of you at the same time just step forward. And that patient will slide right up the bed. So there, it's Don't have to lift. pretty slick. Um, you can stay there. Getting the patient's legs out of the bed. Um, how many times have you guys had the bed all the way down to the floor? You've leaned over, you've grabbed the legs, and you've pulled them off the side of the bed, right? How much pressure that is on your lower back. Bring that bed up to your working height. It's, uh, it's completely okay to have that bed up to, to where you're working to save your back. As long as you're going to be in front of that patient with their knees right in front of you, that's okay to do. Once they're sitting, then you put the bed down so their feet are touching the floor. 
So we're going to show you how, how nicely that works. So you can demonstrate that. So our legs are going this way, so our arrows are pointing this way. So all Judy's doing is are taking her legs. <laughs> See how easy that is? So use it, guys. That's what it's there for. It's to help decrease our, our uh, back injuries. Use your lifts as well. Um, that's what they're there for, to boost our patients, to roll our patients, especially those max assist patients that are constantly sliding down to the end of the bed. Use your lifts. Put the full lift sheet underneath them and lift them up. I answered a call light yesterday, and she was clear down at the bottom of the bed, and I said, all right, well, let's get you boosted. So I started hooking up the lift for her, and she said, oh, thank goodness. I'm glad you're lifting me with this lift. It hurts so bad when they just lift, take the sheet and boost me up. So listen to, listen to your patients. They really do prefer to have that lift 